Okay, we are recording. So wow. thank you everyone for um, joining us for another week in Psychology of Money. We have a very special guest this week and that's uh, Mike Whitaker, who is the author of the book that we've been reading all semester long, Decision Makeover. The students actually just finished reading the book for this week. So they, they know all about the book. They've read the whole book. They've taken quizzes on the book, so they're they're in good shape for this conversation today. And um, thank you so much for joining us. I thought we could just um, go through a couple of questions, and then I'll leave it open for the students to ask questions, or you can just hop in with your own insights. Um, but I thought maybe we could start off with an initial just question about, can you tell us a little bit about your background and a little bit about why you were motivated to, to write a book? It's a lot of work to write a book. So, you know, give us a little context right. about you and then, you know, the, sure. the reasons for the book. Sure. Well, first of all, congratulations on choosing what I would call a good tool for your class. And and uh, these students, I think, will be able to apply this years ahead. So I just kudos to you for doing that. Uh, my motivation for this book came from just observing, uh, you know, over the years, if you're observant, uh, the example I gave, I would go to my class reunion every five years, my high school class reunion. And I started noticing the difference in the stories among the classmates, my classmates. And at 5, 10, 15, 20 years, wow, what a disparity. But we all had similar backgrounds, similar, we had the same teachers, some of the same resources, you know, and such. Like, what is the difference here? And I, I couldn't ignore the fact that it was decision making and that made the difference. And what was exciting is some of us were very excited about our futures. And what was sad was some of us were like in the classes were not happy with how our lives turned out. And I think that led me to believe that, well, then there's got to be something we can do with this. Something, there's some model, there's some issue. Um, and, you know, and we're also human. I, I, I go back to that. The older I get, the more humble I get about how fallible we are as humans. It's by design. Uh, our parents didn't create it. We just, we have these traits. And I write about some of them in my book, such as, the, you know, becoming the decisionator while we, when we make the worst decisions. But uh, my motivation was to try to put some structure to something that seems so mushy. And as I, as my kids were getting older, I realized, okay, you know, that wisdom, you know, you you can tell them all you want as a parent, but uh, some of the best wisdom comes from outside the family. And so if I could write something that would help other people, uh, I thought that'd be really cool. And so uh, I set out to try to structure how does the world look at this? And uh, I looked at other books on decision making, and some of them were so academic, some of them were yeah. so research oriented. And then I looked, and there was what I thought was lacking was a common, like a practical look at an average life, or not maybe maybe the things that would affect or come into an average life here in the United States. You know, we we have the benefit of you know Maslow's hierarchy writing higher up than the, the daily physical and security needs in the United States. If we were in Southern Africa, we might be just, our decision is where to hunt today and we're lucky if we get anything. You know, that it's a completely different world here. We have the luxury of decision-making to, to try to reach some utopia of what a success means for us. And so, uh, but it is a competitive utopia we're all pursuing and everyone can't win. And um, that's another thing that's interesting is, uh, you know, discussions of the American dream. And uh, if you work hard, you know, you can do anything. And um, I always felt like those aren't telling the whole story. Those are, there's a big and at the end of those, which is work hard and make good decisions. You know, dream big and make good decisions. And so uh, that's why I felt like, uh, you know, this discussion need to be told. And, and when I finished this book, it was a few years ago, um, I was, I was happy with it. I was, I'm going to write, se I'm writing several books I've got, but I'm, I, as I mentioned to you, professor, I, I'm wanting to rewrite this book a little more. I want to include how the world's changed with COVID. I want to include, and you made a brilliant point about, you know, how decision-making around money, something I completely did not detail 
Uh, but I think it's going to become very important going forward because the cost of living is not going to be changing. So, um, but back up now, go to my, your question about my background. My background is one of, um, I've always wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I have a, a really hard head that goes with a lot of resilience. So I can take a lot of hits and work really hard. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I had a few, a couple corporate jobs out of, uh, out of my undergrad graduation. And, uh, uh, I found that I was more interested in creating my ideas, may, bringing them to life. Uh, and so that's, I've been independent and, you know, on my, on my own businesses for now 25 years. Um, that is a very hard road. Um, but if you really are an independent, uh, it's one of the few that you, you can choose because you just, everyone irritates you or you irritate everyone in the workplace. So you kind of have to create your own path. And, uh, but, but in that I did my MBA because I wanted more tools. So I had my master's and did my MBA and, and that helped me understand how to evaluate businesses. And then, you know, as people have said over time, by the time you're age 40, you have met every type of person you're going to meet most of the time. And if you're observant, you, then you'll recognize those people as going forward. So I'm, I'm the type of person that I like to build models and I like to build businesses and ideas. And I felt like those that could could embrace a better way to look at decisions um i felt like they would have a leg up and my kids would and and and, and um as i look back at the book this morning uh, i was looking at that earlier section that talked about the different stages everyone's in in life the young the young group that's in the prep stage and versus the group the, my kid my oldest two are now hitting the critical stage in the low 20s and uh i'm like ah because so much takes place right now that it's going to affect whether or not they feel good in 20 years about what they're doing. And, I'm, and I would love to, anybody wants to debate that because I just feel like most of the major successes and, and failures occur um, in those early decisions, the biggies as I call them, right? And so um, uh, I'm, uh, I, want to, I want to do a better job, I think, coming up with some ways uh, kind of like rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki did. Yeah, and, we uh, covered that in our class too. Oh, did you? Yeah, Good. the students did watch some videos and, and oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I loved how, I loved how he is, when he first started out, I, I bought his first book and, uh, you know, t teaching me just simply the difference between an asset and a liability, you know, and um, you saw that in my book when I talked about, you know, good debt is writing, you know, is buying something on, with debt that's going to write you a check every year. You know, that was Kiyosaki, you know, yeah. and so I, but I, I'd like to I'd like to talk more about money and, and in decision making. But um, the part I'm happiest about the book is I hope it um, I hope it reminds people that success isn't money. And I think I, I talked about that. You don't you, wherever you are, wherever in what part of the country, rural in the cities, success is not the bigger mortgage and the, and the necessarily it is happiness in the way you want it, in the balance that you find really pleasing, because no one has it all. No one gets ten out of ten, and I'm happiest about that concept being discussed in the book about you know a success definition is is strictly yours. And it's mine, and uh, and you, we're the only ones that care about it, and we're the only ones that can judge it. Um, but if we're realistic, and then the other concept I, I I saw in the book this morning, I was like, oh yeah, I love that one too, which was uh, that mathematical equation of subtraction, which is you know what I achieved minus what I wanted is my kind of how I'm doing, my score. And I thought that's so sobering. Uh, if you ask people. This one more point about the research I did on the book. I interviewed a lot of people about regret and about where they are in their lives. And the saddest comment was when they would say, this is where, isn't where I thought I was going to be. That was the saddest comment. And it was pervasive. So I resolved, okay, how do we change that? But, the, um, but then that led to when I'd ask them what they do about it, that concept um, it led to me understanding that people do the goal grooming exercise and they will reduce their goals so that that equation doesn't come out negative 
what I what I achieved minus what I wanted. They'll just reduce what they wanted. And it's the easiest thing in the world then to come out. Well, I did all right, you know. So <laughs> lower the bar, and um, that's unfortunate. And so um, certainly we're trying to prevent the negatives and enhance the positives. Um, and one more point that I thought in my research I was kind of struck by is that uh, generally people do a really poor job of setting goals. They do a really poor job. They kind of look around what everyone else is doing. They move with the herd. Uh, they look at society's thoughts of what's successful, what's on, you know, what's on social media and these expectations. But they do a really poor job of personally setting goals because they're so used to having things set for them. They tell you what you're going to do all the way through high school. And then you, you'll go into curriculum at you know, university. They're going to tell you what you're going to do there. You're used to having goals kind of set for you. And then boom, suddenly, okay, go. And, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're now, you're, like I said, you're CEO of your life. And you're supposed to then manage. And there's no manager without goals. So I feel like everything we do about decision making, if it doesn't pivot around a goal, it's blind. It's kind of it's kind of mushy. So anyway, my background is an independent thinker. I like solving problems. I love people. And the results of this book have been pretty amazing in terms of the tributes I get in emails. You, this changed my life. I the big reset people over 45 love that concept. So anyway, that's a long winded answer. And in, in, but that's how I got into this. And um, I plan to do more. Yeah, that and that's great. Um, I, you know, as an academic, I've read a lot of books on decision making, and my background's cognitive psychology, so I'm familiar with a lot of the academic stuff. But um, I thought this book really resonated with you know college students because it really is about the broader definition of success, right? It's not just about money, and that's what I'm trying to get across in this course is. If you manage your money well, you make good decisions about your money, you're actually eliminating a lot of stress from your life. And then that allows you to do all kinds of really cool things. So I think that the, the things that you're articulating in the book, really, um, the students like it. They really get a you know, lot. Of the, the concept of, um, we talk about in the book, it's later, uh, it's called decision dividends. But I was reminded of that. Um, these are the things you get when you've made good decisions. Right. And freedom of time. Yeah. yeah. Freedom of stress. Um, and I feel like when you're growing up, you don't really, you get to, your parents take that burden for you. You don't get to, you don't really experience that. That's, they, that's their job. They don't want you to feel that way. But when you get out in life, the dividends of good decision making are what you just said, which is, uh, you know, they're not going to have the anxiety that comes with bad decisions or the ropes that bind you of consequences we talk about. Right. But isn't it hard to teach something that's never experienced yet? It's conceptual. Right. You no. Know? Right. Uh, it's like uh, it's like uh, trying to explain to someone what uh, marriage is like, and they've never been in a serious relationship. It's like they can't even, you know. So, isn't it isn't it our goal? Uh, from an older generation to the younger is try to pass down what's wisdom without the consequences. Right, right, right. So um, I guess you talked about this in, in your last answer just a little bit, but I thought we could talk a little bit about education as one of those mm -hmm. big life decisions. A lot of students sometimes don't finish their degree and then they regret that. And um, a lot of times, um, you know, the decisions, like you said, the decisions that you make in your early 20s about education or coming back and going to school, those are so mm -hmm. critical in terms of lifetime income and even retirement planning. So why do you think it's so difficult for, for people to make good decisions? Do you, do you feel like sometimes they don't get the support that they need or um, it's just overwhelming to choose a major or that, you know, where do you think all the the challenges are in making good decisions in the area of education? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I'm a pretty big critic of the machine that's cranking, just cranking people through and stamping degrees. Uh, it's changed a lot. Uh, when I finished with my undergrad in 91, you were guaranteed a job. There was no way you weren't getting a job. 
And uh, because only 40% of Americans had undergraduate degrees, today that number is so much higher. And, and uh, so, but the machine has, is, is the head of the, of the awareness of the person, the customer, the, the, the customer, or the student, how could you possibly know what you want to be? And these degrees are structured and backfilled with cu curriculum that, well, you got to start here. So this many years later, you are locked and loaded. Let's say you thought you wanted to be an accountant. Well, good God, after all that work, what if you didn't want to be an accountant? Um, so it's hard to know, hey, what, what's going to make me happy? What's going to make me interested and get up every day? And uh, what's not going to feel like work all some of the time? And um, unfortunately, and I, I've told my older kids that you have to try a lot of things and check that box and say, uh, well, not that. Yeah. <laughs> not that. <laughs> the idea is to do enough of those things. It's kind of like going down a trail. You just want to walk down and far enough where, yep, definitely not that. And you go back to the main path and you, you got to test a bunch of things. And um, it's kind of like relationships, maybe more, more first and second dates and less long-term relationships because you got to say, no, not that definitely, you know, and so you, I think what's hard, what you asked, what the, why it's so difficult, it's that there's the machine is built to crank out graduate degree or degrees and shove you into the workplace, independent of whether the workplace wants what they're selling, what's what, you know, what the university is producing. So back to what does the student do? I wrote in my book, um, I talked about being unique and valuable. I said, I said, what makes someone desirable? Who gets the job? Who, who, if I had to choose between two candidates, what's the difference in two candidates? Well, based on my situation, if a, is a, is a, in a career selection process as a student, if I don't know exactly what I'm going to end up doing, and by the way, no one's going to do the same thing their whole life. Nobody's going to do that, right? Right. And we often don't tell our students that. that oh, I don't, yeah. absolutely. I mean, yeah. I had to, again, I wouldn't have thought I'd have been independently employed for the last 25 years, you know, but, but uh, the student, what I tell and I've told my kids is that, is that try a lot of classes, even ones that don't necessarily fit your major, because you never know. And you'll either check a box. Nope, not that or maybe the goal of the undergrad in my view is to get an awareness about what makes your mind excited what gets your mind going is it do you like analytical do you like logic do you like do you like uh social uh work welfare work type not you know like do you like caring for other people you're trying to get the big category sorted out do you like solving problems do you like helping people do you like serving or do you like creating? To me, the big categories are what those muscles you're exercising in undergrad and all those all those classes that you'll be asked to take to get a degree. Hopefully you've exercised those muscles in each of those categories and you say, be aware, you are not your degree. I think that's a big point. You are, that is a recognition of a piece of work. You're still evolving. You're still growing. Now, in the work you did, what what did you like and that's where you i tell my you know i told my kids in your third or fourth year of undergrad identify a mentor identify a professor the, the research shows that students that had a mentor in their second or, or the third or fourth year of college undergrad were 85 percent more satisfied with the degree that's yeah. a huge number so i said find a professor you dig it you're going to offer some help hang around do some work do some research they're doing consulting off campus, whatever. But you get aligned with a professor and you're starting to build what I'll call your secret sauce. Um, you're collecting experiences around what gets you excited. And, and, and you, then you go out and work and you try some things out. And in my view, then if you want an advanced degree, like a master's, it's based on what you're interested in solving. I would always discourage a master's out without ever working because you know, you're like a missile with no fins. You, you, what do you do? You don't know where you're headed. Why would you spend the money and focus and lock yourself in? But the master's is about what you're really interested in doing. But why is this so hard? It's because we're in a hurry and 
parents want to see results. The costs are so expensive. Uh, the tuition is so expensive now. You can't, people are afraid to make mistakes and take extra time, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so that's part of it too. Mm -hmm. We have to be okay with, we have to be okay with recognizing that the undergraduate experience is foundational. It is not the end all. Uh, it's a start to building and uh, uncovering your talents. Your parents aren't necessarily have, have been able to be interested in discovering your talents. Their job was to raise you. You get into undergrad and uh, there's a system you have to get into. The system wants to just crank out the work. It isn't about awareness. Awareness comes in these fleeting moments when you're talking with an advisor that's really good or a professor who takes an interest in you or uh, you have a summer job and that's where the learning occurs. Oh, that's me. I like that. You know, so um, I, I would say it's hard in the way to not make it so hard is to your perspective is to I'm a learning, growing human. This is not going to be the last thing I learn. I'm going to get this degree. And even if it's not quite perfect for me, I'm going to go gather other experiences and I'm going to figure out what makes me tick, what my special sauce is. People will tell you, there's another book I absolutely love, and I've given it away so many times. It's called The Unique Ability uh, by Shannon Waller. Uh, and it, it's talking about, you don't spend time on your weaknesses. It talks about, you have a unique ability. People are going to tell you, if you listen, you're really good at that. You should do more of that. You, you know, you excel that no one does it like you do. You listen to those things over time, you start to understand that there's a, core unique ability that you have. That's what you want to foster with additional education experiences and things like that. And um, that's a decision. It's a decision, you know, to not be put in a box, to be flexible. And um, the most critical thing for the, if you're in your 20s, is to not get lashed or tied down with consequences and commitments while you're still learning about yourself you have to remain movable flexible transitionable mobile or you you're stuck and the saddest thing in the world is to be stuck when you're still wanting to grow so anyway that's well that that's a good point to transition to my next question so the one of the things i really liked about this book is it, it's not just about decisions about like career or you know, um, those sorts of things, but there's personal choices that we make all the time, like relationships, who we spend time with, who we pick as a significant other, those kinds of decisions. We, we tend not to be analytical about them, but you kind of take an analytical lens to that process and, and say, you know, you want to be intentional about those choices. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about why you think that's really important? I think that really resonated with the students when they read those sections of the book. Specifically about relationships? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's stick. Okay, certainly. And it is, um, I was just having coffee with my wife this morning. Uh, we were talking about this, we were going to, we were going to do online today. And, and uh, we still believe she and I, that our best decision we've ever made, the biggest decision we've ever made that went, that went good or bad was us choosing each other as a partner. And I talk about that one plus one equals three mathematics and it is truly true the problem the problem that society has is that if you've never had a good partner you don't know what it feels like um and parents don't really teach they're so trying they're so protective they don't teach about relationships they just don't want you to do any damage so stay away from that person don't add you know good bad whatever um or, or they have no opinion <laughs> right no opinion or, or i don't want to know yeah uh, Right? Uh, right. But <clears throat> partnership is not love. Partnership is an opportunity that love creates. So you have an attraction with somebody, it opens up a door to figure out if they could be a good partner. And love will not keep a bad partnership together. Love will not overcome bad traits of one or the other. It won't, it won't overcome one person is good with money one person's horrible with money it won't overcome a lot of things so therefore you have to do diligence when you're evaluating somebody 
And unfortunately, it combines with that other concept I wrote about in the book called fail fast. Um, you're going to meet a lot of people in life and you're going to do a lot of things. And when it's got your instincts kind of tell you this isn't going to work, you got to need to fail fast because there's an opportunity cost. If you stay with this person, you're missing out on meeting the next one. And a lot of who we meet in life is just random luck. I mean, I ran into my wife in a weight room in college working out at a fitness center. I mean, what the odds of that? It's crazy. I have some great people who've never met, I know that have never met somebody good that they deserve. Like you deserve a great person. They can't meet them. So I think you want to be available. And, um, and so the decision-making about partnership is, is, is something that you have to be aware of the cues. Now, the cues are, does this person make me better? Or does this person make me worse? Does they they draw energy from me? Or do they give back? It should be positive in terms of the equation. They give me more than they take. Um, relationships that take more than they give, you have to recharge by yourself to get be in that relationship and they don't work out long term. Um, so two independent minded people who are happy with what their life is going or they're excited about make the best candidates for partnership. Um, partnership is about mutual goals you share. It is about mutual moral compass where things that are, are okay and are not okay. Um, it has to fit without a lot of effort. It's kind of like um, um, some people, things come naturally and some like um, we were watching The Voice. We watched The Voice on TV the other day. And each season's winner on The Voice, when they sing, it's effortless. That's the word. You can, like, everyone else is breaking their neck trying to sing that song, but this one over here is effortless. The relationships are going to work when you're in your 20s and you have low stress and yeah. you don't have a mortgage. They better be <laughs> natural and effortless. Mm -hmm. There's no conflict because. That's because if, once you amp up the pressure on performing as a partnership and you have whether it's bills or kids or whatever careers, you're going to add a lot of stress to that relationship. So when there was no stress, it should have been effortless. So if it's hard in your early 20s when you're just getting to know them and all that, it's probably not going to work out. And so um, choosing your partner is the biggest decision you will make. And it's really, really important to be selfish and realize that there's a lot of people on this earth and you don't have to pick the first three you meet. The problem is you have to be understanding that it is a numbers game and some people get lucky quick and some people do not, but it is a numbers game to find that fit. And you just back to what we talk about in the book, if your objective is to meet someone great, then your decision making has to be then i want to put myself in a position to go meet more people i want to ask good people who they know that are single so you have to make it a prime goal and you will meet somebody and you have to ditch the thing that you've been holding up with a crutch in order to be in position to do that so Hopefully. um can I ask a follow up question then, sure. you know, um, another thing that resonated with students is surrounding yourself with good people and that you just mentioned that like, you know, if you haven't met a person that has resonated with you personally as a close relationship, maybe tap your close, close people around you because, you know, um, you know, they would be a good resource to find a person but um, a lot of times you don't even think about that. Like who is our social circle? You know, obviously you have the family that you have, but also you pick your friends. And so your friends have different goals. Your friends have, you know, right, right. different work ethic, you know? Um, so being intentional about your social circle, I guess, goes with that. Right. Yeah. And it, it, it the five people you surround yourself with really are a good indicator of, of, your mind is always bouncing off these people. So it's kind of like, is the mirror a good mirror or is it a funhouse wavy mirror? Wacko, you know, it's like, what are you getting back in reflection from other people around? And, and the tough thing about younger ages is that your, your group is changing. Like you left high school, that group, they, they didn't come with you. 
They're back, they're back wherever they are. You're not with your family. Um, you got thrown together in school with your roommates, you got, you know, your classmates, but you all change classes. You, you know, if it's a big school, you don't see them again. Uh, you're, it's very fluid early on. Um, after undergrad, you're going to keep a few college friends and now your new network is going to be who you work with, your peers, where you're working, how you're working. And so that's always changing. The, the, the only thing I think that is constant is you keep an eye out for quality people. I, I, I find that a fascinating thing. I'll, I'll find a quality person in the, in, in the drive through a McDonald's. Work <laughs> I will find quality people uh, in just the interesting parts of, of life. And um, and some of them, you have the occasion to say, what do you do? Where do you go? What do you, you know, and you start a, start a conversation or a relationship somehow. You keep your eye out for quality people. What's rare is that thing. What's not rare is, well, we're all thrown in the same dorm. Let's make do. You know, people of like-minded interests and talents, people that have, you know, encouraging i wrote about in the book your hobbies say a lot about your your go forward learning um i would say focusing on the who's doing some like-minded hobbies is a great way to meet some quality people um my daughter was an acapella at new york nyu and that was her network it became an amazing friend group uh for her um but com things that are of common interest you have a reason for being around them that's why you get to know them better so um, the, who you surround yourself with, certainly, um, but, but uh, if, at that younger age, if I'm looking back at it, I got a, I've got a few people I'm around because I, they make me feel good, they make me laugh, but I got to be around somebody, at least one or two people every so often that pull me forward, pull me up. I want to be around people who are smarter than me, that are more talented than me, to remind me that this isn't exactly where I want to stay. Now, that's my preference, but I'm telling you, when you have somebody pulling you up on a regular basis, you will go up. You will rise. That's great. Well, um, at the beginning of this talk, you talked a little bit about regret, and we all make mistakes. We all make, you know, mistakes through our, in, our entire life. Um, you know, you've said you've had lots of conversations with people about, you know, the big reset and mm -hmm. how they did it. How do you think what's what are the things you've learned from those conversations like you know when things go badly which we all have what's the best way to approach it you know so that you can move forward you know based on the experiences of you know yourself and other people one of the one of okay one of the tests we all will will acknowledge at one point or another whether we passed or failed is do we learn the same lesson the hard way twice mm-hmm do are we smart enough to recognize not doing that again um you know i think the i think the thing about when you know regret is when a, is a is the anxiety of did i make a poor decision becoming real because i have confirmation yes you made a poor decision and that turns into regret regret is not created it's trans transferred or converted from anxiety about a decision and it's like, oh gosh, I should have gone left, um, and I went right. You know that kind of thing. Um, you're going to have poor decisions. The best thing I find to do is to do kind of a mental autopsy on what went into that decision. Why did I choose that? Was I the decisionator? Was I not of great mind to make a decision? Um, did I not have a goal? Did, did, did I not have a valid why for why I made that decision? But um, uh, recognize, I think I talked about in the book, there's a, if you, if you want to dumb it all down, you just fill in a blank. The consequences of option A are this, if it goes bad, the consequences of option B are this, if it goes bad and you have A or B, you're going to choose which consequences can you least live with? Don't choose that one. And, uh, that's a great way to test it. So, um, you know, the regret, the, when you're younger, the regrets, hopefully aren't horrible, um, but they, you're learning how to make decisions and evaluate, you know, remember you are a learning organism. You are learning how to work through the world and think for yourself. And I'm telling you, we don't get it right ever. 
And it's not, it's not, there's no age where suddenly this light bulb comes on and we're all fantastic at decision making. Um, we're all, like I said, back to being very human. But um, regret is something you can minimize if you have a process of, of thoughtful decision making about recognizing the trivial decisions. Don't spend time. We're just, you know, order what you want for lunch, wear what you want to wear today, whatever. But this, the, the medium and big decisions, those get a pause. If you'll just recognize those, then the, the, the volume of regrets you accumulate will be very low. Because when you recognize, oh, that's a medium decision, I only make one of those a week. Mm -hmm. I only make one big decision a year. So if you recognize just those, you won't have a lot of regret. Uh, when you do have regret, um, like, oh, I should not have done that. Um, I just simply ask myself, what did I learn? What did I learn from that? Okay, let's raise my hand. I failed. All right. All right. So what did I learn? I learned I shouldn't eat chocolate. And I learned that whatever. And, uh, 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 or as that country song says, tequila makes my clothes fall off or whatever, you know, I've learned a valuable lesson of what I should not do. Okay. So you plow that into the past and you say, okay, now, as long as I don't repeat that, what am I going to do if that happens again? Um, if you aren't bright enough to recognize and you repeat that, then you're going to have a hard time. So, um, but uh, I think regret is something you got to tell your mind. You get this moment, now we're moving on. Because I don't know about everybody, but my mind likes to rehash things. I'll replay crap that bothered me from years and years ago, the decision making that went bad. And I'm like, why? Why are mentally to me in my head? I'm, why are we talking about this? I'm trying to sleep. Why are we pulling out the fact that blah, blah, blah? Yeah. Well, you have to tell your mind what you want. And right now I want to go to sleep and shut up. You know, your mind is not always going to be your friend when it's talking, when it's shuffling out. It gets bored and it pulls out of the closet. Well, let's talk about these old bad decisions. You have to tell your mind, no, no, that we're only thinking forward. That's past. Give it up. So regret something needs to be put away after it's been evaluated. That's that's a good point. Um, it, it dovetails nicely on the next question. So when you do make decisions, a lot of times it's really hard to to manage the emotions because a lot of times those big decisions have a lot of emotions that go with yeah. that yeah. big decision, whatever that is. So. Um, how do you set aside the emotions? Like, how do you, you know, really focus on, you know, the, the core question of what, what good decision should be made in this circumstance when emotions are so, you know, strongly at play? Because I think that that really yeah. is a critical thing that we all Absolutely. need to learn how to do. And once you get good at that, I think that really helps you become a much better decision maker. It's not that emotions I mean, don't exist. It's just that they play a lesser role in, in that moment when you make the decision. Yeah, that's right. It's a great question. Emotions are a huge part and instant gratification has been made easier. Amazon has made that horribly easy for my household. <laughs> I click and I'm get there to get there tonight. That is not a good decision. That's a good decision making uh, when you can uh, be no, when there's no time for, you know, there's no time and they make it so easy just to click and be done with it. But to the best, the good news is too, the older we get, the faster we can do the process. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like driving. When you first started driving, you weren't necessarily skilled at going fast or through difficult, whatever. But as you get more experience, you can make decisions faster and, and, and be confident. Um, the, but you have to start out with is you're learning how to do this to slow down and you make the evaluation offline. Um, you might make it on paper, your pros and cons. Mm -hmm. You have to pause. I mean, the best advice is, is that if you know that it's a big decision and the consequences of it going wrong are notable, um, especially around money uh, and people, um, you really have to say, just take a pause. And you say, you know, like I talk about, deflect and say, I'll get back. I'll, I'm going to come back to this. But you have to think about it because not everyone can remove emotion quickly. And I, I mean, I remember when you when you think you're in love, it, it's impossible to think logically. And though I talked about too, if you are, you're not sure you can even make the decision without emotion, you triangulate. 
and you ask a person who loves you their opinion and you ask a person who is not family or, or a close friend for their opinion and you you put yours with those two and you've triangulated the and that's how I get out of I get a best decision I can get when I can't get my mind without emotion I triangulate uh, but the, the the first piece was um, uh, you just have to recognize your decisionator. You know, you've got your your you've got something going on, and you're not in a good mind. I think that's one of the things that people people have to understand that their mind is not always in their best interests. Yeah, yeah. Their mind is, you know, their mind is a, just a tool, and it's got its own attitudes, and it's got its own negatives sometimes, and it's and you have to say, okay, it's kind of like you're talking to. It's like, all right, when you're of sound mind, we will talk, but not until. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but when you've been rejected, when you've been angered, when your pride's in the, you know, um, there's so many, like, we're so human about that. So recognizing, hey, I'm feeling like the decisionator is a big deal and recognizing that I need to make a list of the pros and cons here. I need to make a list of the consequences. And I'm sorry this isn't fun. It's not sexy to take a moment, pause and slow down. But and it might feel good to be swung up in the moment. But I talked about the difference between successful people and non-successful people is the successful people have the ability to make a more thoughtful decision. And that's how you separate yourself. Are you one of them? Or are you a, gonna be a kind of a ping pong ball uh, to your own emotions and such? Um, so the fastest thing to do is get good at recognizing exercise the muscle of am i the decisionator and is this a big decision and if, if you can say yes to both of those it's a big decision then and i'm a decisionator then you got to take a pause that's great that's yeah. great so um one of the things we talked about in this class is um yeah. understanding risk and the idea that you know we often associate risky behavior with bad things like you know risky drinking or risky drug use or something but risk is not necessarily bad. You know, we have to take a lot of risks. And, and one of the things in this class that we talked about is, you know, investing in, in stocks for your retirement seems risky, but really in the long term of 30 years of a retirement investment, they're not risky. Um, so um, risk comes into play when you make career choices. Mm -hmm. um how do you how do you frame risk how do you think about risk and and how do you avoid the bad things that come with risk but also capitalize on the good things that come with with um looking at risk and and taking advantage of things that other people are afraid of well the thing about risk is in opportunities you have to filter out the black swan events that grab our attention and make us think we're being left out. Um, I didn't invest in Bitcoin, but you certainly heard about it, right? Yes. You certainly heard about a lot of people being making a lot of money. Um, I was kicking myself, had regrets for a long time about Bitcoin. I just think it's a great example of noticing there was risk there and, and everyone was getting wealthier. So there didn't seem to be a lot of risk. But especially when you bought it for $500, you know, but the point was, is that I, my fundamental was I couldn't tolerate the kicking of myself when that was going to go south. I couldn't tolerate that. And that's what kept me out of it. I couldn't tolerate down the road how long I was going to kick myself over. You knew better, Mike. <laughs> yeah. I, you're, so, um, the prudence required to look at, you know, risks is, you know, what can you live with in, in downside consequence? I wrote in the book, you know, um, I will take the risk that I can stomach, but I won't take risk on behalf of my family. Meaning that, I mean, we may, I won't take risks where we have to start over. I may take risks that we're going to have a change our standard of living. We're going to cut our budget for the, you know, for the rest of the year or whatever. But I'm not going to put them on the street or make them, you know, I'll get a second job or whatever. You know, I'm not going to do that. Knowing where the risk you can tolerate line is, is pretty dang important. Um, but you have to take risks to get the rewards. There is no riskless anything. Um, 
it's like taking a risk to meet somebody you're attracted to. You know, you had to put your foot out. You had to get it. You had to get out there. You had to say hi. You had. Um, uh, I think also the. Um, in my personal opinion is the risks that I take are about usually business ideas uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm investing in usually my own. I believe in what I'm doing. Um, and so uh, piling on behind a bunch of blue chips that are overvalued, right. You know, in the last couple of years, I haven't done that at all. Um, but again, because I think that being aware of the value of things is going uh, is, is, is pretty dang important. Um, I go back to Kiyosaki, uh, the risk I would take if I was back in my 20s is I would do my best to buy a piece of real estate. I would do my best to buy a duplex and I would live in one half and I would rent the other half and then I'd leverage that and buy another one. And I'd have an annuity my entire life of rental income off two duplexes, for example. Um, that's the kind of risk, <clears throat> enterprising risk, I think is, is great. Um, you know, just to be, I want to hit your question, right? What kind of risks else are you thinking about? Well, and I'm thinking too, like, um, you know, in, in career choices, you know, sometimes you're presented with two job options. One seems safer. One might be more risky, you know, um, you know, one, one may be close to home. One may be far away from home, oh, you know, like great, all great kinds question. of things like those. Yeah, kinds great, of great question. Um, I just, this is fresh off my conversation with my young my kids who just finished college. I said you can always come home, but once you're here very long, you'll never leave. Get out. I really I believe that I did it. I went as far as I could get when I graduated. I went to the tip of Florida, from Kansas, and I, there, it was more of a metaphor for me. But I I had to work my way back. I had to I wanted to get out and see what the rest of the world was doing while I could do it. People don't take big risks once they start to leverage themselves with mortgages and kids and and parents they got to take care of and all that stuff. That's not when you're going to take risks. Yeah. Now is the time to take risks. Costs are low. Shoot, you don't have to. You rent. You you got to you know you travel whatever you go out and figure out how you and the world interact and what you have to offer this world and go find out. There's a different kind of people. You'll be shocked at how different the people are. 300 miles away from where you are right now. And if I was, in, and you mentioned, and you know, your university is rural. Right. right, yeah, we're in the middle of Kentucky, yeah. Right, you can't necessarily have perspective about the world. I, was, I grew up in a small town in Kansas. I, that's all I knew. And until you leave, you don't realize what the rest of the world's doing, how they act, what they value. Some of the great things about being in an area that's got more talent and population if you want to you can always come back to slow rural lovely quality of life you can always do that uh, i did that to raise our family uh after you know when they were in middle school and high school but for right now in the 20, 20s get out go see what the world's got going and because you'll regret it now, I would tell you, you have a decision to make, you A or B. Right. You don't ever do anything, you're going to regret it your whole life. Just ask, just ask anybody who's chosen to stay and they think, I wish I'd have gone out. Not that you can't be happy, but again, you can, you, it's your choice. So I would take risk on the job that, that cultures my heart and finds Let's me learn more about myself and the world. And then you can always work my way back. Right, right. That's great. Because you make multitude of decisions in life, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, and also uh, the thing that's interesting too is uh, you'll, meet, you'll meet people and potential spouses that are complementary to you, not the same as you. You know, when, you, when you're finding people just around your area, there's not a lot new. Yeah. And not, you know, and that complimentary, there's a whole load of host of things that could be complimentary in somebody from some other part of the country. Right. So um, we just, we have a tiny bit of time maybe for one more question. It's so totally I thought up to you. I'm, I'm going to make time, whatever you want, but sure. However you'd like okay, to do Okay, great. And um, so I thought, you know, 
we loved this book. Are you planning to write anything? You said maybe in the beginning, you're thinking of working on some projects. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you're working on or, you know, what you're, you're planning on doing with the, you know, writing? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that, but I want to make sure you make time for any questions from the group. So, yeah. And I, I like where Lily's at, wherever you're at, Lily, I want to go there. <laughs> that was, looked like hey, a nice Coral. place to be. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to, I want to, I want to write this again, and this is going to, it's going to be called, um, decision making for life is going to be the new title. And, um, I want to include a post kind of a post COVID view of the world and remote work. And, um, I want to talk about, I believe the cost, the, 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 the change in inflationary costs, especially housing has really tied us down to how much risk we can all take how much flexibility there is um it's reduced it's reduced the what if i'm gonna you know try something out uh, a good example would be um if you were going to try starting out your own business you know that's that's doable when you know i was paying 400 dollars a month for rent but not 1400 right you know i mean there's just so little gap or you know uh, openings anymore for failure there's no so much so much room for failure there's, there's very little room anymore i want to talk about how we deal with that how, how we still find time to take risks whether it's in our if, if you were into music and art or uh learning more um, about ourselves getting more education i just i feel like decision making for life i think covid did a lot i, I read somewhere that COVID, the COVID two years advanced personalities 10 years. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. And also it changed the developmental trajectory of kids. It did. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, yeah. I think it changed value systems too. And I'm happy. One thing I'm happy about is it changed value systems for, uh, I want to be, I want to be happy where I live in my, I want my home to reflect my, you know, my work life balance. Um, I, I like that it probably reinforced family, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but also it it created a lot of hardship and change in society. I want to so I think decision making. I want to I want to do that. I also you made a good point. I want to talk more about financial decisions, and maybe offline you and I could talk about what you feel like the biggest areas would be. But I'd like to add that. I'll even interview if you'd like for the book. Yeah, and, but I feel like the. I feel like the book can be crafted um, better for the audience too. Like, I would love some input. Should we write this book and specifically say what age group it's for? Would that be smart? That, yeah, I, like I, I think like you know, um, you could probably have multiple books tailored based on certain demographic groups. You know, because certainly the challenges of a 20 year old are very different than a ch the challenges of a 50 year old, mm -hmm. you know, who's maybe like considering a career change versus starting out. And I know one of the big things that our students have experienced, at least from the financial piece, is that they are responsible for their retirement where their parents have no context because they were they right. were set with pensions. They didn't really have to worry about it. So they can't even ask their parents, you know, how did you plan for retirement? Because they have a pension and social security and they're fine and they don't really have to. So, you know, I think the demographic groups really do have different experiences. And um, uh, I know COVID really hit the 20 year olds really hard. They're really prone to anxiety as a cohort. And so, you know, that high level of anxiety um, is impacting their decision making in different ways. You know, they're less likely to want to take any sort of career risks or or things like that because, they, you know, they're just more anxious. COVID, you know, <laughs> was a really hard on that group, I think. Like, I think older people had a little bit easier time of it managing the isolation and things like that. Um, so Something we've never been able to evaluate before. Uh, yeah, cost, like we've never been that. through anything yeah. like it. Yeah. yeah. And like, I think too, like, we have a lot of students who they didn't like online school initially, and now they love it, because they enjoy being at home in their who doesn't, 
Yeah, comfortable surroundings oh, in your kitchen with your snacks and On, online uh, online classes are going to save the universities, but are going to be a watering down of uh, the message um, and the uh, the greatest illustration I can give you is is that if if we were all going to meet in the same room on a regular basis, everyone's getting their game on an hour before to half hour before the class. You're, you're getting ready mentally. You're putting yourself there. You know there's content you're going to talk about, um, and you might get called upon, and you might contribute, and the professor's got to deliver, and all that. You go online, nobody's got to be completely prepared. Prepared. Nobody put their mental game on but more than two minutes before they turned on the camera. There is a problem with online, and it's going to be ferreted out. You're going to see the best organizations understand where the line is and how much needs to be in the office versus online and all that yeah um, that one is a huge one sometimes. that's a huge yeah. one yeah it's like what is work going to look like you know how much can we have people work at home but how much do we need that in-person collaboration yeah. it seems like every company you could write an entire book about that like how every company is going to grapple with that because it seems like nobody knows the answer you know, uh, just on back to the career discussions too with your your students. Um, I think one of the biggest decisions that that people can start to look at is there's only two big buckets of jobs out there. Um, your career, and it's one I see it as you're either going to be part of the task based class or the creative class. The creative class gets paid for what it can create out of nothing. Music. TikTok videos. My daughter has a full job. All she does all day is create TikTok videos. <laughs> but she does it for some great companies, some really blue chip companies. She's really good at it. But the point is, she has to create every day. But the creative class is creating something new every day. And there's a lot of risk and it's a lot of fun. The task based class is serving up some product and they're paid to punch a clock. They're paid to have a certain cadence to the work they're going to deliver a certain product but they don't have to be that necessarily that creative but they're just the they're, they're a part of a machine and they get paid to do it the folks that are creatives the sooner they figure out that they're going to need to be on the creative class the more the quickly they can adjust their curriculum i feel like that is a completely unmet discussion right now that's needed is there's a lot these the kids that are they're so creative they're so funny, but how do you separate and help them make a living in the creative class? Well, this is great. This is a great ending because the students in my class do a creative project at the end of the course. Yeah. And I, and I tell them we're doing this creative, like we're not doing a final paper, standard final paper. We're doing a creative project because that's what companies want. They want to see that creativity. Yeah. And I've seen some amazing things like artwork and music and, you know, plays and, you know, all kinds of like game boards. I've seen everything under the sun. And um, yeah. And I think like generally we don't ask for that in higher ed we in yeah. higher education classes we don't unless you're like a visual arts student or a music student or something like that um you know we, we, the majority of the university ignores creativity i think well, but that's what companies want right well you're you're defining the difference between a huge difference in output from what separates us from china right or or other social socialist and fascist countries is that the thing that makes the United States and its work workers different is our freedom to be creative and the university was this stuff was designed to crank out graduates for corporate America and the university still have not adapted the curriculum is still based upon this degree is going to have to have 132 hours and it's going to be doing this and you can take you know nine hours of something that might be creative and uh, so there's a lot of work to do there. So I applaud you for encouraging creativity. I think Ben, back to the back to the folks that might watch this video, um, your creativity and how you approach it becomes your secret sauce. Wherever you're applying your talents in this world and whatever career you do, 
you're going to be known for what you bring uniquely that's you and it's going to be from your creative your creative spin on whatever that business does or co- or organization does you're going to be known for your take and how you you know how you created something new out of that you're not going to be known for your spreadsheets <laughs> yeah necessarily you're going to be known for your idea of we do this and this and this, you know, that's unique. Um, The decision-making, the decision-making back to what can they do early is to try a lot of things and take classes that might be of interest. So you can either check it in, check box, rule it in or rule it out. But what is, I know to be true about our careers is you can't make yourself do what you don't want to do very long. So get, know you know yourself get right with what makes you excited every day it has to do with your education and what could be a career out there well that's a great ending i do want to make sure if there's any questions from the students happy Happy to take them. any questions or um i can also forward questions later when the other students watch so don't want to put the students on the spot lily henry penny come on give me something (laughs) Totally unrelated to the book and what we talked about. Well, what part of Florida did you live in? Boca. Oh, okay. That's about like an hour from me. Yeah, well, so yeah it was, uh, it was funny. I, it was, uh, early in my very first job and I could hard, I couldn't even afford to hardly live there. That's, yeah, it, it was crazy. It's expensive down here. <laughs> <laughs> it's so expensive. I mean, we were trying to look at places cause I'm like, okay, I'll move out soon. I, I can't. No. It's so expensive. I'm not even kidding. Rent is around two thousand a month average. Yeah. It's so expensive. Yeah, that's and a lot. It only got worse after COVID. Yeah. Hey, look, hey, put an ad out that you're willing to be a nanny. <laughs> for I have to be able to bring my dog. I have a Newfoundland. <laughs> nanny with a dog. There you go. <laughs> All right. Penny said she didn't have anything. Henry, any questions? Not that I can think of. Okay, great. What well, was the? Uh, can I ask the question of um, any of these students? Uh, what is the most important thing you think you got out of the fact that this great professor chose a great book for this class? <laughs> now, what what did you what did you get out of it selfishly? You thought made a difference. If I could ask for you. Okay, I'll guess I'll go first. Um, like the book, like how she chose this book and how that has affected us. Just the overall yeah. idea that you have a professor looking ahead and coming up with a, a kind of a, a way to address your future by getting you to think. Majorly helpful. I love my parents and they're great, but they're young parents. Like my mom is 20 years older than me. So I never was really like taught a lot of these things. So I was like, I saw finance, like psychology for money class. I was like, okay, that'll be great. Cause I know I've made financial decisions that maybe have not benefited me today. Um, don't regret them necessarily, but they didn't benefit me. So like this class has definitely helped me think more future oriented with all of my decisions, not necessarily just financial, but all of that. And I really think that it's going to help me going forward, you know, compartmentalize, you know, what is important now, what is important later, and what do I need to do to make sure that what is important later is taken care of. Bugs. Well said. (laughs) That's great, because that's really the goal that I, when I designed the course, that's really all I wanted, is I just want people to take a pause and think about the future and you should record that snippet of video as the testimonial i know take this class it's really good and you can live in florida (laughs) absolutely anybody else have something anybody else penny or henry uh no i think lily covered it all (laughs) at least all that i can think of right now cool uh, I would like to add something. I I messed up when signing in, but my name is Christina. Um, hi, Christina. I like, hi. Um, I like the concept of the big reset. I thought that resonated with me pretty well. 
Um, I actually had a college degree in game development and I couldn't get into that field. And then I got into a warehouse with Amazon and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So, um, and then I eventually got uh, moved up and stayed there, went back to school and I got into um, uh, maintenance technician. And I started debating whether if that was the right choice for me or not. So I feel like the big reset helps um, give an idea of what, like um, don't stick with it just because it pays the bills and um, it's, I'm in it and might as well stick with it, but maybe figure out what I really wanna do. So I, I felt that the big reset really uh, hit me on a personal level and make me, cause I didn't wanna feel regret but make it um, feel like a, um, um, lack of better words, but a point in my life where I can be more open to change. Wow. That, and that's so great. Can I spin off on that a little bit? Uh, I'd like to, first of all, great point. Uh, you, you remind me to, to emphasize that, um, I said this earlier, but I think it needs to be restated that uh, we are constantly evolving. Um, and recognizing that none of us are going to do the same thing for 40 years. Um, it's it's an interesting dichotomy. If you compare the illustrations of my parents and or your grandparents where someone worked at the same place for 25 years or whatever, right? And they, and they re retired and, and, uh, and there's this sense of permanence, like, well, they're stuck. They did that. They, they were happy. It was good enough for them. That world doesn't even apply. That's such a foreign concept now. You know, I don't know that some of us ever want to retire, not completely. I think, I think the idea of, if you'll keep in mind that you're always going to be growing and advancing, putting new things, tools in your toolbox. Um, the fact that you started out with one thing and you recognized that wasn't my thing, even though I had this piece of paper, I, I wasn't, I wasn't my necessarily my thing. And you keep going and trying new things. Remind yourself that you're growing and advancing and learning. And that's, you should give yourself a lot of credit for that because it's a lot easier to put your head in the sand and just grumble and not change. Mm -hmm. A lot easier to not move, but you move and you take, it takes mm -hmm. courage. And that's part about being around people. Like I talked to you, I uh, talked about the people that are around you. You want at least one or two of those people that lift you up, that challenge you, because those are the folks that are gonna say, you can do more. And you're like, yeah, I can. Let me look into that. And I think that's what's great about uh, our peers is that sometimes we're pulling, sometimes we're pushing them. And uh, so thank you for mentioning that and congratulations to you for uh, working through that and continuing to grow. Thank you. Yeah, very good. This has been great. And I just wanted to say, um, Penny also said that, you know, you know, her family wasn't really helpful. She really enjoyed the class because she got a sense of, um, you know, uh, trying out some really useful, realistic things. And um, I think a lot of the students kind of feel the same way. So they, um, they loved your book. It's been a great addition to the class. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time of this hour with us. And uh, we're actually excited to see when the next book comes out. So please let us know. You know, Can, I ask, could... can I ask a favor? Uh, if any sure. of you go to Amazon and do a review. Oh, yeah. I can tell the please. students to do that. For sure. how much that makes a difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can all do that. You know, there's 30 of us in the class. So I mean, absolutely. that would we'd really be happy to. That's the best thing you could do. And then the other last thing I would ask, ask is um, if you're open to it, there's been a common theme and I can't do this myself. Everyone has mentioned that their parents weren't as much help. I, I wonder if I could ask you, um, if I could send you maybe a list of questions, uh, small questions, I'd like to put in the next book, I'd like to start out with a little more discussion of why parents aren't able to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason I want to talk about it. If I would, I just, can I get some of that? Could I solicit feedback from Lily or Penny or Henry or anybody who could, or anybody? That yeah, can, I can put it in the course and I can get that and compile it for you from the students. I mean, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. We're on to something there. Why aren't yes. parents more effective on this? And I'm sure it's because we all roll our eyes as teenagers and yeah, you're right, mom and dad. But, but um, the anything that starts with when I was your age, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I would like to ask for that feedback because I think that I want to give um, I want to give parents permission to 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 accept that they can't be everything. Right. They cannot very, deliver all the solutions. They did their job, but their job isn't to do everything. Right. And so I think that would help. But um, I my door is open. You can email me anytime if anybody has any follow up questions. If anybody's going to do any follow up work on anything we talked about. Um, you all have made me excited about writing book two. Great. And, uh, that's what you've given me. So I really appreciate that. Oh, oh, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. It was really fun and we learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And thanks okay. to all the students who joined us. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Bye, all right. everyone. Take care, everybody.